Hey there, beautiful people, and welcome back to another episode of That's How We Roll, a bi-weekly podcast where I talk with motivating and inspiring women who are professionals, entrepreneurs, organization leaders, artists, and so much more. This week's guest is, oh my God, I can't believe it. But anyway, this week's guest is best known for her roles as Delia Ryan from the soap opera Ryan's Hope and her two-time Emmy-nominated performance as Roxy Balsam on another soap, One Life to Live. And she is Eileen Kristen. Eileen is an actress, singer, songwriter, cabaret performer, and one-time cinema owner. Even though she may be better known for her soap opera roles, Eileen has many Broadway, off and off, off Broadway credits, as well as primetime television shows and movie credits. She originated the role of Patty Simcox in Greece and portrayed the infamous Leona Helmsley in Mayor. Her album of original songs, I'm Not Done With You Yet, is available on Amazon and iTunes but we're going to get into all that juice and a lot more as we welcome today's guest, Eileen Kristen. Welcome, Eileen. Oh, it's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can live up to any of that. Uh, it sounded good. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. You lived up to that and so much more. Yes, definitely. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I'm thank so glad you. to have you here. So, so how are you? How, how have you been? How are things going? They're going okay. It's been a strange time. Let, let's face it. This has been a very, very strange year. And um, sometimes it's hard getting your motor going. But I'm back in my Bikram yoga class, which is good because uh, that gets me out of the house. Because for the last year and a half, I've been doing so many Zoom classes. You forget to go outside sometimes. And yeah. it's important to go outside because you never know who you're going to run into and I ran into someone today that I really feel like I needed to have a little chat with. So, And it was a casting person. I'm not going to say who. But it was kind of um, happenstance. And it was good because right before I left the house, I was listening to an interview that Oprah Winfrey did with Lady Gaga, which was really surprising on so many levels. But the takeaway from it, and there were many things going on in this interview that kind of were shocking, but the takeaway was that sometimes when you don't feel like doing something, you need to go out and do it. And I needed to go out and buy some some cold things to drink, <laughs> and I didn't want to do it. I was just going to drink cold water, but there was a voice inside of me saying, Lady Gaga would like you to get out on the street now, <laughs> because because it's important for you to, and I put myself together and I ran into this casting person, which really was kind of important. And I got my cold drinks, so that was good. Gary and I, we love these drinks called Bai, B-A-I. Yes, I like those I too. Know. Oh, there's nothing better than blueberry Bai. Yeah. On a hot day. Yeah. Oh, no, yes, with some extra ice. Oh, I'm a big ice person. <laughs> well, when I have water, I never put ice in it, but I do like, I'm from the South, so I love sweet iced tea. So whenever I make tea, I always have ice in it, but I never like cold water. Maybe if it's really warm out, I'll put an ice cube in it just to get a little chill, but that's the only thing really that I don't have ice in. But everything else, I love I having ice in it. You know, that's funny because I never really was a big um, ice water drinker because it bothered me for some reason, but I like ice and everything else. Yeah. Uh, but today I put, I actually put, uh, I put ice in, in my water. I, I did a Pilates class uh, on Zoom and I had to have some water nearby. It was very hot. But Lady Gaga inspired me today. Excellent. Who knew that Lady Gaga would get you out of the house and go get your bye? Yeah, that's fantastic. I know. <laughs> and flowers. And I bought flowers which are very important for me to have in the house, fresh flowers. If the flowers are uh, close to dying, it's not good. Mm. So I I get rid of them. Well, as somebody who, because you were always like on the go, you're always doing something and you were always performing. How did you keep going and how did you stay 
motivated during the past, well, especially last year? What did you do? Well, here's the interesting thing. It just coincided with the pandemic. We, um, the original company of Greece and all the other companies of Greece that were tied in with the original, which was like the, it was about a 10-year period at the Royale Theater, basically. We were writing a book called Tell Me More, Tell Me More. And I had to write several chapters for the book. And uh, it was a good thing to do during the pandemic, it, really getting in touch with things that happened, do I dare say, almost 50 years ago, mm. which is shocking. Wow. Really shocking. During the pandemic was a perfect time to do it because you had to stay. Really, you know, you didn't want to go out. So it was a perfect time to do things that you probably would not have taken the time to do or felt at least relaxed enough to do any other time? Well, the interesting thing was the first couple of chapters about really difficult aspects of, of like my audition and my first week of rehearsal, those came out of me pretty easily. Mm. It was talking about, I was there for two and a half years. That was hard to write about. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know where to end. I didn't know where to, and a lot of things just rolled into one. Whereas the audition, I remember my audition like it was yesterday. I remember all three auditions. I had three auditions. And I remember the first one as if it was yesterday. It's funny how you can remember certain things like that and other things you can't. Other things are just like a kind of, not a blank, but just a wash. Because it was two and a half years. And, you know... I didn't p- try to pull any stunts. I, I, I've always treated this like a business. So I, I, I don't know. I was pretty professional about the whole thing. I, I didn't stay out a lot. I didn't, I didn't get sick a lot. The hardest, not the hardest thing for me to remember, but the hardest memory was the day after doing the show for two years, I got out on stage and I literally, for the first scene, didn't know what I was talking about. Wow. My first lines were, hi, kids, well, don't say hello. And I don't remember anything after that. I got distracted by something going on off stage. I noticed before I made my entrance that the prop guys didn't put any bubble gum out. And not that my character, I was the cheerleader, the goody-goody, so I didn't chew bubble gum, but all the other pink ladies did. And I noticed that there was no bubble gum out there. And also that the, I think it was stage, I want to say stage left, smelled like alcohol. (laughs) So I can only assume that one of the stagehands was having a little bender going on or something. So what happened? So when I hit, I don't know. I, I don't know. I just know the bubble gum wasn't put out there, and it smelled like alcohol. And I, I went out there and went, hi, kids, well, don't say hello, and that's all I remember. And from that point on, until this very day, I always have a script in my dressing room, and I always look over any scene that I'm going to be doing, I read it over. Or try to run it with the person that I'm going to be working with. So, yeah, it scared me. It really scared me. I, I really don't know what I said. And I remember the pink ladies looking at me, and they and nobody knew what to do. And no one threw you a line? No. 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 <laughs> no. I got through it. I... It was a very bizarre experience. So when I had to write about that, that was that part of it was easy, but it was just the 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 whole experience of doing two and a half years, and really, what that experience and was and why it was so difficult to leave was because this was my social life, my friends, my everything, and I left without another job. I knew it was time to go, so I left. And how I knew it was time to go, I I really don't know. And I didn't work for a while. I didn't work for at least six months. But that's when Ryan's Hope came up. 
I left Greece, I think, in October or November, and then in May of the following year, 1976, 75, 75, um, I got the call to audition for uh, Ryan's Hope. And I didn't really care about doing a soap at all, but once I read the Bible for the show, I really felt like I was the person for this part. But I didn't really want to do a soap, so I remember saying to my agent at the time, well, I really want to do a comedy. I don't really want to do a soap. He goes, oh, this probably won't last for longer than six months. <laughs> I don't know why he said that. Right, but then you brought that Eileen Kristen charm, and that all changed, right? Well, not just me. It was a combination of me and Kate Mulgrew and Helen Gallagher and Bernie Barrow. It was really quite a group of people and Malcolm Groom and um, the chemistry of that cast for Ryan's Hope was unbelievable. Shirley Rich, one of the, the late great Shirley Rich was the casting director and she didn't bring a lot of people in but the people she brought in were very significant and you know Shirley was one of these casting directors that would definitely voice her opinion to the producers. She held nothing back. And if she felt somebody was right for it, she would go to bat for them. Unlike a lot of the casting people now, they're just, they just bring people in. They don't voice their opinion too much. The right. good ones do. You're right, right. the good ones do. The good ones do. You know, the good ones probably like Ellen Chenoweth and certain people, Billy Hopkins, uh, they probably do voice their opinions, but Sometimes they're really scared to they're really scared to say what they think before the audition because if the act, actor comes in and tanks, then they look like an idiot. Mm-hmm. But Shirley was never afraid of that because when I walked into the room for my first audition, Claire Levine and Paul Mayer were like smiling and like they were so excited because obviously Shirley gave them a you know an earful. She was really in your corner. You know, that's one of, like you said, the casting directors, some of them don't do that anymore. So you know when someone is in your corner and they're pulling for you and rooting for you. Right. And the first time I went in to see her for that, I came in in some some clothing. I was, actually, I was rehearsing a play with one of my castmates who had left Greece also, Tim, Tim Myers, who passed away but this was a play and I played like a Janis Joplin type of blue singer and it it took place it was called Blackbird Spring and it took place on the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated so I was dressed in like hippie gear and I went in to see Shirley and she went well you're so right for this Eileen but do not wear what you're wearing (laughs) <laughs> to your ne- next audition. <laughs> so, I, of course, I didn't. But what was ironic when I auditioned for Ryan's Hope, I was not told not to wear white, so I wore this white blouse, which probably was flaring, because at that time those cameras couldn't, they couldn't handle white. And when I did my screen test, I wore the, because I wore white, I wore this white shirt for my second audition, so then when I was coming in to test, I wore the same shirt, and as I was doing my audition, one of the buttons burst, and actually, that's probably what got me the part, because they said the button just flew off, and and Eileen just went right on, (laughs) so uh, they thought I was rather brave, because I guess the, the button that blew off was in a particularly sensitive. I, uh, my bra might have been showing. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, back to the Grease book. It took me quite a while to write chapters. Like I let like four months in between the first four chapters I wrote and the second two chapters that I wrote. And I actually wrote to Tom Moore, who was the director of Grease, but he's editing the book with Adrian Barbeau and Ken Waisman. Ken was the producer, and Adrian, of course, was one of the actors in it. And Adrian has written several books, so they felt she was pretty expert at doing editing on this book. So I, I kind of wrote an apology letter to Tom saying that I just kind of, oh, I know, the election was coming up. 
the 2020 election was coming up, and I was so nervous. And I was doing, uh, you know, I was giving a lot of money to Democratic causes and really nervous, and I couldn't concentrate. That's what happened. You couldn't focus. Couldn't focus. So, um, but I got them done. And I don't know if all of it is going in the book, but that's pretty exciting. We have our 50th anniversary, and I think we're all going to be celebrating it in New York. I hope the people from California come. And the book is just, you hope that the book is finished for the 50th. Well, the book is not going to be finished for that 50th anniversary. Okay. We thought it was going to be. We thought it was going to be able to come out. But it takes it takes a long time for them to edit it. And, I mean, I think they've, they're done editing, but now it's with the publisher. Now the publisher's got to look at it, check for everything. And it may not be out that much, you know, after the 50th anniversary. But it's, unfortunately, we're not going to have copies of it beforehand, which might actually be a lot easier to deal with because if there are certain things that are strange issues in the book, at least we don't have to deal with that person <laughs> in person. That, so, so that's probably uh, for the best. That, that way it would come out after the fact. It might be. <laughs> it, it really might be. It really might be. Yeah. Not that I wrote anything. Well, I wrote a couple of very controversial things, but it didn't have to do with cast members. It just had to do with what was going on in my own life. And also, I uh, I had a very difficult first week. I did great auditions for the part of Patty Simcox, and when the reality hit that I was going to be playing a cheerleader that I didn't like, I did not like this character my first week of rehearsal, and I didn't know how... To overcompensate for finding her very annoying. And I wanted to play Marty, you know, the cool girl who smokes cigarettes and wears the cat eyeglasses and big blonde bouffant wig. I mean, that's the character that I wanted to play. And, you know, go, growing up in Brooklyn, uh, I never even met a cheerleader. So I could do the audition, but for some reason, I really had a, a hard time with it the first week. And I got over it by the second week. Mm -hmm. But the first week, I could barely say any of the lines. I thought I was going to get fired. I really did. But your talent prevailed, and you were able to just put it behind you and go, go ahead and do it. Well, what happened was, uh, I won't mention names, but the lead character in it kind of had a crush on me, and I had a crush on him. So it made me feel like this little cheerleader. Mm. And I suddenly just started thinking of myself as Patty and not as Eileen. And that went on for a couple of weeks until he dumped me. But <laughs> <laughs> but by that time, you already had the character in the bag, so. I did. I did. <laughs> I totally did. I totally did. But it was almost easier writing about the stuff that stood out in my mind very well. And then then after that, I've, I had to, uh, over this last six months, I had to write, I'm receiving an award from a college that I went to for exactly one year. And this was right before I got Greece. I was actually in college, Finch College on East 78th Street. The school doesn't exist any longer. But it was a very difficult year. I had a terrible thyroid problem. And um, I was very unhappy. I didn't want to be in college. I had done a lot of work before I got to college. I felt like I was back in kindergarten. So I had to write the positives about that year. That was not easy. Mm. But I did it. I, I think I got through the pandemic having to do some interesting projects. Yeah. And then did you create anything? Because that usually, you know, when you have that downtime of not going, 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 like you constantly do, like we all do. See, I'm just the opposite. I, if the more I do, the more I can create. And what I did do was I took out um, something that I'd written called Walking Lou Reed's Dog about my experiences dog walking in the mid-90s because I lost my job on loving very mysteriously and very quickly, and I, and I needed to make money. And I wrote a really interesting piece about, about the six months that I walked dogs. And one of those dogs was Lou Reed, the rock and roll singer. It's his dog. And it was a, 
another very difficult time, but a rather humorous time. So I took, I dusted that off, and I'm, I plan to put that to music. It's not going to be a song. It's going to be like a poetry set to music. So I'm working on that. It sounds interesting. Oh, it is. It's quite interesting, actually. You know, it's really coming to terms with shedding, you know, because I've been on television for so long and being in the public eye and then all of a sudden doing a job that I felt strange doing. And not that it was beneath me, but everywhere I'd go and every doorman that I'd go to pick up the key to get the, the dog, they'd recognize me. They'd recognize me from something. Mm-hmm. And they'd always say, what are you doing here? Why are you working for a dog walk? It was, it was tough. It was tough. Well, let me ask you, what were your beginnings in this business? Like, how did you know that this was your path, that acting and performing was, was what you wanted to do? Well, I knew that very early on. I kind of heard a voice. We had a, a summer house at the at the beach, my family. Uh, we lived in Brooklyn, but we had a little house in Long Island, uh, the uh, Atlantic Beach, which is the very start of um, Long Beach. And I was taking a shower one day, and I heard a voice in my head go, and it sounded like the good witch from The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> <laughs> Billy Burke. And she said, you are going to be an actress. Because I, I, as a kid, I watched I watched Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movie. I was completely taken with them. I watched I Love Lucy and the Gale Storm show, and I was enraptured with that. So I kind of knew where I was heading, but when I heard this voice in my head, and I went, oh, I'm going to be an actress. And that was about, I don't know, six years old and... And I started dancing. I started dance lessons when I was about seven or maybe earlier. But it wasn't until I was 14 years old. And I was studying with one of the the most amazing dance teachers and choreographers and dancers in the world. His name was Matt Maddox. And he was very famous. He was in a lot of movies. He was in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. He was one of the brothers. And he was the one who lifted Marilyn Monroe up and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And he was uh, Sid Therese's dance partner. Well, he was my teacher in New York City. He had moved from California. He decided his his performing in movies were over. You know, the, 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 the era of all the movie musicals was over. So he came to New York to teach. And at 14 years old, I was in his class. And he came over to me. I probably had been studying with him maybe since I was 13. He came over to me when I was 14, and he asked me if I wanted to be on the Bell Telephone Hour dancing. Wow. And that was my my start. I didn't have to audition. He trusted me, and I that was my first job, and it led to, it led to many other jobs as a dancer. I worked with Michael Bennett when I was 15, in a sh- in a Broadway show called Henry Sweet Henry, which was the musical version of the World of Henry Orient, which was a very successful movie that Peter Sellers starred in. Donna Michi was in the Broadway show, which was not quite a substitute for um, Peter Sellers, for sure. But it looked like it was going to come in and be a hit. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a hit at all. But working with Michael Bennett was scary and and gratifying, but uh, I had to prove myself to him. But I ended up working for him between, uh, I worked for him from 15 until I was 18 years, pretty much almost 18 years old. And then I promised myself that I would start studying acting because I knew I wasn't, I wasn't a proficient enough dancer to call that a career Mm -hmm. for me. I was very limited, but I was, I had something as a dancer but not past a certain point. Because I could play a kid, but once you have to play an adult, you have to be a better dancer. And I knew that I wasn't. So unless I was brilliant, I was not going to have any career. And I I know I was right about that. (laughs) (laughs) So I started studying acting, and I started doing a lot of commercials, and went to college. I went to professional children's school for high school, 
And then I went to Finch College for that year and then got out and I fixed up my thyroid. I finally got the proper diagnosis and got my thyroid to function. And then I started auditioning for a lot of commercials and auditioning for television shows. And then I auditioned for Grease. And I somehow knew I was going to get that. I don't know how I knew that. I remember going in for uh, Godspell. And I never did my audition for Godspell because I didn't, I didn't really understand what I was supposed to do for the audition. I was supposed to learn one of the parables. And since I was not familiar with any of them, I, I just, I just didn't feel like I, I was going to get, I felt like I was going to make a fool of myself at the audition. So I remember, you know, once again, I trusted that voice in my head that said, go home do not audition for this and learn your monologue for Greece. And that's what I did. And then you booked Greece. And then I did. Yes. And then, you know, just Greece obviously somehow led to my getting Ryan's hope because when I went into Shirley, she had seen me in Greece and she thought I was wonderful. And I had done a couple of other auditions for her for some movies and she pushed for me for, for Ryan's Hope. Mm-hmm. Well, Ryan's Hope was one of my favorite soaps uh, back in the day, and, and I also had the great pleasure of working on One Life to Live, like me, it's a few times with under fives and, and sometimes without, but I really, really admire all the soap actors. Just the, the Unbelievable. Yeah. First of all, the pages. Unbelievable. It is really an underappreciated skill and level of professionalism that soap opera actors have. And, you know, when I ran into this wonderful casting person today, you know, I I told him, I said, I really miss doing a soap because you got to play this character that the audience could get so close to, which doesn't, it, it happens on some TV shows, but on a soap particularly, it, the audience just feels like you live with them. Right. They're seeing you more often than you would on a weekly, because most of the time on TV, it's like a weekly thing, but on soap operas, they see you every day. Exactly. And what I was going to say about the, you know, listen, I've seen the scripts. There's pages and pages and pages of dialogue. And I, I just, I mean, it, it's just mind boggling because on, you know, on TV shows, you know, you have your scene, you might have five scenes, right. but you you know, you get to do that scene 20 times in a lot of cases. And it's a very short amount of, of dialogue. Yeah. I really appreciate and just admire. Oh, we had some tough days. We had some, Ryan's Hope, they wrote monologues. I had a scene, it was a 12-page scene in a confessional. And all the dialogue was really on me. And, and the priest would say, and go on, my dear. And I would just talk, 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 talk. And it was, and the editing machines, um, you didn't just stop tape. And if you stop tape, which I had to do in that confessional thing, because I, after getting through like about nine pages, I got to page number 10, and I, I, I really didn't know where I was. It was tough. So I'd have to st- I had to step out of the booth. They had to contact the editing room or something or the camera room in New Jersey, and then they'd roll the tape back, and then you'd do it again. And, mm-hmm. uh, but it got to be easier that they, you, you could really stop not that they'd like you to stop tape, but when I was doing One Life to Live, the, the, the equipment was so advanced that they could stop and start because we had so much stuff to do. You know, I had, uh, one, I've had 80 pages to do on One Life to Live because we would shoot from like three different shows and we would sometimes not shoot in order. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it got... It got crazier, much less rehearsing, and sometimes they go, "Okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna tape," and you go, "Don't I get a rehearsal?" Well, you know the scene, I, and I go, "Yeah, but I gotta test out my timing," you know. Mm-hmm. And it was pretty crazy. It they pushed a little too hard. 
that was a, it was a lot of stuff. It, it, it was a lot of stuff. And, you know, it, it, and it was nonstop. And then it was even worse if they had to stop tape when it had nothing to do with the actor at all. It was something on the camera side or something in right. the booth or something else. So that made it even worse. So now you have to go back to, you know, to page five of the of the 25 that you've all that you've already completed. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it could be it could be difficult. Sometimes I would I would love when that would happen because I felt like I wasn't I, that the scene could be better anyway. Right, right. And you get to do it again. Me, and I have to, and I have to admit this. I have stopped. I have stopped tape when the other actor was drowning. If another actor that was not experienced was doing the scene with me, and I felt that they could do better, I'd figure out a way to stop that tape. Mm. I wouldn't do it that often, but I would, because that actor needed to have a good representation of what they could do and it was almost like they just needed they just they almost needed to feel like I was at fault to booster them up I, I can't explain I, I uh, no, I know yeah I know what you mean because I knew I wouldn't get in trouble for it basically they wouldn't stop even in the middle of the flounder because yeah. they would not want oh that this guy stops or this yeah. person stops in the middle they didn't want that on their uh, as part right. of their reputation. Especially if they were even doing it under five. You know, it was important that every line count for them. Mm-hmm. And and if I felt that we could do better as a scene, I'd figure out a way to screw something up. I know that there are going to be soap fans that are that are listening. So I, what I want to know is because now there are no soap operas on really except for General Hospital that's on ABC as part of that group. Right. And so... I want to know if Delia or Roxy, by chance, may actually go to Port Charles. Well, I did. You know, I did go to. I know, uh, but go Delia. back. No, but I want to know, I know. if. Yeah, well, I, I know. It, it's very enigmatic to me how they did not have me. That they did not ask me to join that show, and it remains a mystery to me. Now they were sending me back and forth. So it was over a two-year period that I was doing some stuff on General Hospital. I've been getting, people have been contacting me on Twitter and wanting to know, because they keep on mentioning Delia, or they mention Ryan's Bar, and I don't even know what to say to people. I I know. Well, you know, listen, um, one of your former castmates from One Life to Live, Roger, that played Todd Manning, he's, he's, I think he's had like three or four reincarnations on, on General Hospital. He was just uh, killed off as one character. I know. And now he reemerged. really strange. Yeah, that's very strange. It's so jumping the shark just constantly. It's just, I'm, I, I don't. I don't really under I don't really understand that show. I know, but I, when he came I, back the second time, I was like, okay, so why isn't uh, Delia back, or why can't they bring Ro- I don't know. A- or Roxy? Because either way, if they can bring back somebody as a different character several times, then why can't they bring you back as another character yeah. like I mean, later on? Quite honestly, I'd re- I prefer to play Roxy because I really. Uh, I had so much fun on One Life to Live. I I think I had the most fun you can have legally. <laughs> you know, just, you know, Delia was always this incredible responsibility on an emotional level. Whereas Roxy just, it was fulfilling my, I, I just, I, I just loved every second of mm. it. Not that I didn't love playing Delia, but uh, Roxy was like, uh, that was my 9-11 gift. I, I, I got the job the day before 9-11. Oh wow! And and the day of nine eleven, I was supposed to negotiate, and the lawyers were calling my agent, and I went, "What? Well, you must be joking! We're not talking. We're not going to even be talking about money or anything having to do with money today." Because you know, and I told my agent, I said, "I go back for free. I, I, the world is so screwed up right now. Mm-hmm. What does acting mean? Mm-hmm. What is?" What does any of this mean? We just lost like five thousand people today. I, it was it was insane, and I didn't really understand the place of acting in the world, in that post nine eleven world. Uh, but then I realized, well, it's time to entertain the troops, and I started at the end of September, 
And I knew that my goal was to entertain people, no matter what. And that's been always my goal. My, you know, it was never about really filling in a hole for myself as an actor. I, I, I had a really good childhood. I had a really happy childhood, so there was no, like, big, empty space to fill as an actor. I, my goal was to entertain people. I had been doing it from the time I was young. I was entertaining my sister when my sister was in a little grumpy five-year-old mood. I was there to entertain her. And that was my goal. And that is still my goal. That is the only goal I have. Just to entertain. It's really the only goal I have. I, I, it's not that I don't like to make money or to work. and I just like to entertain people. That's my quest. Yeah, exactly. Well, you've had so many great runs on soap operas, uh, many soap operas than the ones that we've talked about today. And so many times soap actors are seen as as just that, nothing more. So no matter how talented they are. So how was it for you? That's true. Yeah. So how was it for you after leaving the soap world, if only temporarily, having played such wonderful characters on the soap? Was it harder? Did it hinder you in getting other work? Uh, it it did hinder me a bit because I really felt like I was ready for this for the sitcom world, especially you know with some of the things that I did initially as Delia, I was just ready for a sitcom. But whereas Judith Light was able to make that transition for whatever reason, I was not able to make that. I ended up doing some nighttime stuff and some film, but it was, I, I, you know, I've never done a sitcom. I've not been cast in one sitcom, which was very strange to me. And I don't know if it was because of my soap opera background, but anybody who had ever seen me, particularly as Roxy, I mean, I, I was working without a laugh track, but if I had a laugh track, it, I think it would have been, you know, or if I was working in front of a live audience, I would have had a lot of laughs. So it's always, it's, and also when I did Loving, I did a really funny character on Loving, Norma Gilpin, and I worked with Walter Bobby, and we had done Grease together, and we were doing some amazing things together. It was like our own comedy show. So it seems so ironic to me that probably one of the funnier people who's ever done a soap, which is me, has not gotten a sitcom. But, you know, life's not over yet. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but you're right, because Judith Light, I mean, she's ugh, amazing. And you are absolutely right. She went from that without missing a beat. And there are other soap actors, just like yourself, you know, some of them have try to do film or to do TV or something else, and they just ended up coming back to, to soaps. Well, it's funny, because I, I, did, I did a film, I was a lead in a film when I was 19, and sitting there in the, in the room, uh, in the screening, in, in the theater, and watching me on a big screen really freaked me out. And I, I've always been more comfortable with the smaller screen. You know, I... I was a TV kid. I mean, I, I TV was like another member of my family. But and and as I said, I was an I love Lucy, you know, nut. I could probably, as a kid, I probably could recite the scripts. So it's just ironic. It's really ironic that that. And I've I've gotten to do so much comedy on on stage, and and so much comedy just doing One Life to Live. But. It's just ironic that I was not able to make that transition. Well, like you said, it's it's not over yet, so. Yeah. Well, I remember the first time that I heard you sing. You sang with other performers at, at Symphony Space. It was oh, the, yes. the Women in the Arts and Media Coalition at the Vintage Awards, and I was a board member at the time, but I'm now serving as a, one of the co-presidents of the organization. That was my first realization that, wow, oh, wow, that's, that's Eileen from One Life to Live and Ryan's Hope. She can sing. Oh, wow. And you were, you were great, I, I thought. Yeah, Shellen, Shellen Lubin. You know Shellen? Yeah, of course. Shellen had got me involved in that. I did one of her songs, and then I did one of mine. I believe I did Lion's Den, and that was a fun evening, as I recall. 
Well, I'm really looking forward to listening to your album, and it's called I'm Not Done With You Yet. Yes. What is the title about, and and what is this album about? Okay. Well, the album is about a lot of different things, and it's songs that I've written over at least a 10-year period. And I'm Not Done With You Yet actually was written about a gentleman that I used to be involved with that our relationship just, we we just never, we, we didn't end it for, <laughs> we just couldn't end it. And it went on through a lot of uh, twists and turns. And we're, we're no longer together, but he's still a good friend of mine. He's, and I've known him ever since I'm 19 years old. And he's quite a rascal. He's a <laughs> rascal. Not somebody I should be with at all, but mm-hmm. I was. And so that that song is is really dedicated to him, but also I've written songs with him, uh, and he's a very well known uh, musician in the uh, studio mm-hmm. scene. And I've written with some really great people, and but I have to say that I I wrote mostly three quarters of every song, and I've sat down with with the musician pretty much after it's been kind of the melody's been in my head and and kind of made them play what was in my head. Uh, But I worked with uh, the gentleman who produced my album, Scott Yanni, is so gifted. He produced the record and I wrote two songs with him, one called Five O'Clock Shadow and another called Old School Thing, which is about all the music that I grew up with that I really love, that I miss. It's one of my favorite songs. Well, I'm looking um, forward to listening to it. Yeah. And Lion's Den, which is the first song on the album I wrote for my, I believe it was my 50th birthday. And I I really didn't want people to sing Happy Birthday to me, so I figured I'd write a birthday song. Anyway, they sang Happy Birthday to me (laughs) because I did a gig on my birthday. You know, it's very dangerous doing a gig on your birthday because people are always going to sing Happy Birthday to you. But I tried to cut them off at the pass by doing Lion's Den. And, and I figured maybe I'd wear them out. They wouldn't <laughs> sing happy birthday to me, but they still did. The song, While the Whole World Jams, I wrote that during the Gulf War because I felt like all of a sudden we were at war and we were not, there was a terrible homeless crisis in New York at that time in the early 90s and crack problems and I was working throughout the late 80s. I was working at the Prince George. I was doing volunteer work at the Prince George, which was a homeless shelter on on, uh, East 28th Street. I was working with a group of kids, and I felt like our country cared more about what was going on outside of the United States than inside the United States. Mm -hmm. So that's where, and that song came to me while I was on a bus ride to work with this writer, and I pretty much had the song written by the time I got up there, and and he was a drummer, so he had like a drum pattern laid out, and then I laid a melody over it, and he added some stuff to that. And then I used to write with a wonderful writer, Kenny Mazur, who I was in a Brazilian samba band with called Pagey Boy. That's (laughs) how you say it in Portuguese, Pagey Boy. We were the house band at SOBs. And I was writing stuff for a Brazilian, a Brazilian band. And yeah, I can't figure any of it out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. The album is got, is on iTunes and Amazon, so we want people to get it, download it, listen to it. I think it's it. still on Amazon. I'm not sure if it's still on Amazon. It's It might be. I know it's on iTunes for sure. Well, for I, iTunes for sure, so I'm going to have that listed in the show notes. So yeah. I was reading that you owned a cinema. I didn't own it. I I didn't own it. Thank God I didn't own it. I rented, you know, I rented space. Uh-huh. We were I ran a business. I ran a business, but owning it you would have had to buy the space that you were working in. But, but I I started a a film theater with a, a genius kid that grew up as a friend of mine. He was uh, like 3 or 4 years younger than me and he was a he was like a genius. He he understood film better than anybody I had ever met. He was, his family was from Cuba. They left when Castro took over, and he was just this kid that used to tag along with me. And he was dedicated to, well, he used to write film reviews at like 14 years old. And to make a long story short, I ended up sending him, he wanted to meet Vim Vendors, the German filmmaker. So when I was doing Greece, uh, I think he was maybe had turned 17 or 
18, I, I sent him to Germany. It wasn't that expensive to send somebody to Germany. It was like, here's your plane ticket, you know, <laughs> 300 bucks, you're off. And he went and was able to meet Vim vendors and then booked one of Vim's films into what used to be the Embassy Theater on 72nd Street and Broadway. And it was mostly a subscription theater, and it was a, a, a lot of German Jews lived in this area. And he booked this German film, and there was an uproar. And I was Jewish. I'm Jewish as well. And I could not figure out why anybody would be offended to have this film called Kings of the Road about two German guys who just loved film. It was just a really interesting film, but there was an uproar. And I remember saying to Ray, well, if you had your own film theater, you could do the publicity on it yourself. And the next thing I knew, he said, well, I found a space where we can have our own theater. Are you in, Eileen? And I went, I guess so. (laughs) Not realizing that I was going to be writing most of the checks. So we did that for a while. We had terrible landlord problems. I don't even I can't even go into the detail mm. of that because someone will come after me. But the people that we were leasing from were crooks and they were a very big organization and in the middle of the night basically we were threatened by them and we were, we moved to another theater. So it was a lot of hard work. And unfortunately my partner this wonderful kid started having drug issues and left me with too much responsibility. I was doing Ryan's Hope full blast and we had to stop the madness. But I ended up producing a film through NYU through it and I met a lot of incredible people. And we had, uh, I must say, we had a half page article in the New York Times on the, upon the opening of the theater. It was really special and it could have been really special my, th- that partner of mine is no longer alive, and he became increasingly, I don't, know, I don't want to say irresponsible, because he went into politics in New Jersey. I think he was a councilman, but obviously his health wasn't good, and he died very young. Wow. And we fell out of favor with each other because he owed me a lot of money. He did not live up to his promises at all. Well, what motivates you now and keeps you motivated, and who or what inspires you? Well... I I just want to entertain people, so the audience really inspires me. I know they're out there. (laughs) (laughs) They're listening. I know they're out there. I know they're they're out there, and as long as I know they're out there, and when I say they, it's, it's people who want to be entertained. So I'm looking forward to that next situation. I did a, I did a bunch of uh, things for the internet shows. I did one called Melange, which I really thought would have a future, you know, on Netflix or somewhere else, but it didn't get picked up. And uh, I did another one, Tainted Dreams, and i had done a bunch, and one called Pride, that was really great. And it looked like Logo might pick that up at one point. And so I don't know what's awaiting, you know. I, that keeps me inspired that there's some audience out there that wants to see me, I hope. What do you have coming up? Well, I start rehearsal for a show called One, Two, Three, Manhunt at the Theater for the New City on, I believe that's First Avenue and 10th Street. And it's a really good writer, Tony DeMuro, and a director that I've wanted to work with for at least 20 years. His name is Bill Rowderbush. And it's about a guy who loses all faith in everything. And his friends kind of get him back from being on the brink of, you know, probably jumping off of a building on the Lower East Side. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. And it's myself and three men. And I hope we get an audience. Uh, I hope the variant doesn't kick in and yeah. become something more troublesome. Well, if everything goes as planned, when when does it, uh, when is it supposed to sh- uh, premiere a show? Let's see. I have that written down. I believe our first preview is the 7th of October. That's our first preview. And we're doing it till the 24th of October. Yeah, it's going to, I think we're going to be doing it Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays at Theater for the New City. Excellent. Well, I do wish you all the best with that and much success. And I will have the information in the show notes about this play 
and when you might Great. be able to see it. One. Yeah, I'll get the official everything on it. I, I don't know if they've decided if we're doing two shows on Saturday or doing two shows on Sunday. I know one of those days we're either going to do two shows or something like that. Do you have any words of wisdom that you would like to leave with us today? <laughs> well, you know, I always say to somebody, uh, I don't know if I say it kidding around, if there's something else you can do, do it. Acting is a very tough business, but if that's what you love, you have to do it. You know, you just have to do it and try not to take, you know, I've taken no for an answer more times than I really should have. And also, I never really fought for the salary that I should have made. I, I worked very cheaply. And it was always because I was afraid of losing my job or afraid that they were going to say no. And I, and I never really pushed my agent to go, no, fight this. Fight, really fight this and get me what I deserve. So I would say to anybody, you know, if you have confidence in yourself, really follow that through. And I just took no for an answer on things that I probably shouldn't have. And I once wrote to Oprah Winfrey. I was going through, a, it was around the time that I got let go on Loving. And uh, somebody wrote a book based on my experiences at the Prince George Hotel. And so at the same time that I was feeling so miserable about losing this wonderful job, this person wrote, and I forgot the name of the book. I have it, but I forgot the name of the book. I wrote to Oprah Winfrey uh, asking if I could fly to Chicago and spend an hour with her. And I got a form letter back. And I took that as, okay, uh, stop begging for something that you're never going to get. And that was wrong. I should have figured out a, a, a better way to reach her. And I, I really regret that. And I saved the letter that I wrote to her because, you know, I wrote and I said, you know, I'm often asked for advice and I, I talk to people, I go to schools, I talk to people about being successful. And right now I've hit a wall. I've hit a wall and I really don't know what to do. And so I got a form letter saying, well, if you're ever in Chicago, you know, contact us and we'll get you a ticket for the show. I mean, it it had nothing to do with what I had written. Right, exactly, because you didn't ask for a ticket. Nothing. <laughs> I did not. And I thought if this actually ended up on her desk in front of her, she she definitely would have said yes because I know she worked on ABC station and she would have said this this would make either an interesting show or what you know, I did really did not know what to do. I had hit a wall. You know, the only thing uh, you know, I could do is put one foot in front of the other, but you know, it led me into walking dogs and I worked for a jeweler. And, you know, I ended up doing a lot of interesting things, and I don't regret that hitting a wall. But it surely uh, it would have been better had I persevered and said, I'm going to read, I don't care, I'm going to read Oprah no matter what. And I realized that as I was watching this Lady Gaga interview with Oprah, that sometimes you just can't take no for an answer. But I, I didn't have enough confidence in myself, and sometimes I still don't have enough confidence in myself. So I would say have confidence in yourself. Uh, and, and don't take no. Yeah. Well, no is not acceptable mm -hmm. sometimes. And especially for someone of, of the ability that I had and the, the visibility that I had. So I wrote to her about my experiences with this, these kids and about letting them live out their dreams and, and why wasn't I living out my dreams. So I would say just don't take no for an answer. Don't take no for an answer. Eileen, I just want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for showing up and, and just being a beacon of light on the podcast. You've made my day. So thank I really you. You know, Eileen, Eileen means light. Eileen means light in Gaelic or something. It, it originally is from Helen, and it means light. So I try to be light. Well, you are indeed. You are definitely you. a light. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I will have everything about Eileen, how you can uh, listen to her uh, album, and how you can see her when the play opens in October, hopefully. I will have everything hopefully. in the show notes. Okay. So make sure you like, subscribe, and share the podcast. Listen wherever you get your podcast. And thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you soon.
Thank you so much for taking the time to listen, checking out the podcast. Thank you for inviting me into your space. And until next time, I hope you will continue to thrive, grow, and be kind to yourselves and be kind to others. 